Hello and welcome to the launch of the Global Luxury Report 2024. I'm Paul Skeldon. I'm the, one of the editors at RetailX and the author of the Global Luxury 2024 report. And uh, I'm joined today by uh, Emily Stead from Aconeo. Hi, Emily. How are you doing? Hi, Paul. I'm good, thanks. How are you? Excellent. I'm not uh, not too bad at all. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, just for those of you who uh, aren't aware of uh, of Aconeo, uh, if you could just give us a little bit about uh, what uh, what the company does. Yeah, of course, no worries. So um, I'm Emily at AE here at Aquino. So we help retailers, manufacturers and distributors unlock their growth potential by simplifying the product management process, which will then enable their customers to deliver exceptional product experiences across all sales channels. So as a Aquino and as a, as a PIM provider, we understand that great product experiences start with great product information. So by leveraging our PXM solution, we can then empower teams to collaborate seamlessly, enrich product data with ease, and deliver consistent, accurate, and compelling product experiences across all sales channels where their shoppers are buying. Brilliant stuff. And in luxury, of course, uh, that sort of uh, experience is is paramount, um, as we shall see. So um, what I'm going to do, uh, what we're going to do today is uh, go through some of the key findings of the report. Obviously, there's a lot more in the actual report than uh, we have time to uh, to pull apart uh, in this webinar. But hopefully it'll give uh, you, the viewers, a, uh, a taster for what's in there. Uh, so we're going to just look at some of the key findings. Emily and I will discuss what that means. Um, you know, what some of the sort of challenges and, and opportunities those things raise. Uh, and just to give us a sort of snapshot, really, of where the, the global luxury industry is at and uh, what some of the lessons we can learn from it um, are. So um, that's us, as uh, you're already well aware. And uh, that's the cover of the report. Uh, and very turquoise and lovely it is, too. Um, so the, the global luxury market, we've estimated to be worth um, 354.8 billion US dollars in 2023. Uh, as you can see, it's seen sort of constant growth since um, the, the sort of dip there in 2020 during lockdown. Uh, it's already, uh, well, it was last year as well, already way above um, where it was pre-pandemic. So it's 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 recovered well and recovered, I think, relatively rapidly. Um, particularly compared to some of the other sectors that we analyse, it, it, it did surprisingly bounce back very quick. Uh, as you can see, that sort of spread reasonably evenly across um, most things. Fashion, um, sort of apparel, really, uh, is the, the biggest chunk of the luxury market, but, but not to the sort of same extent you might see in the sort of fashion world. It, you know, the luxury market is quite evenly sort of spread between all those things like watches and jewellery, led to goods. Uh, cosmetics and fragrances and uh, small but uh, increasingly significant eyewear um, so it's it's a healthy market it's doing well um, obviously it was hammered by uh, travel restrictions in the, in the lockdowns uh, and that has slowed its recovery but uh, it, it that's all now back on track and it's back in uh, in uh, fine form um, if we look at where those revenues are um, by region um, you can see it's fairly again evenly spread across uh, the world asia slightly ahead there of uh, europe and north america it's just, uh, interesting because um large swathes of asia particularly china which is a huge market for luxury goods uh was locked down obviously the longest well into to uh, 2022 um many instances which did hamper travel and tourism which affected global sales of luxury in all regions um but equally it seemed to generate a reasonable amount of money there and it, it is ahead of uh, the more traditional luxury markets of europe and north america where it gets interesting is when you look at uh, how much individuals are spending on luxury in those regions and uh asia while the biggest market for luxury is by far uh, down there on the actual amount that each individual pays um, per, per luxury item. So, so what we're seeing is that the luxury market is being driven to some degree by this boom in Asian markets. 
Uh, however, it's a it's more of a volume than um, than a sort of uh, spend game. So we're going to see a lot of people buying a lot more lower value, more affordable luxury items in those markets. And I think we've seen many of the luxury brands adapt their prices in that region to match that sort of spending pattern that we see. Um, we also sort of, it, it, it sort of ties up with, with the fact that in those regions, it's often being bought by younger shoppers who are kind of newly wealthy to some degree. Um, and they have the spending power that perhaps a much uh, more mature market spender in Europe, say, would have. However, they are much keener on buying things. So we're seeing a lot of volume at lower price in Asia, which is largely what's driven the growth um, across luxury in the past year. So, um, Emily, just sort of to pause there and sort of take in the kind of uh, overview there of, of the luxury market as we found it. Uh, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I, I think it's really interesting. And what I wanted to do is just start on this amazing quote that um, it's from Dior. So Dior had this um, thing where they were saying, like, tradition needs to be disrupted. So that's why it always needs to remain modern and desirable. And that's exactly what has happened with the resurgence of travel, which you've just mentioned there, Paul, is we've got those high end spenders that have returned to travel. Um what was really interesting, actually, is when I was reading through the report is Europe's largest resurgence was from 5% downturn in 22 to 25% rise in 23. So it's just crazy how everyone now is back to kind of normality, I want to say. But it's not only in Europe where we've seen that growth. Then, like what you touched on there, we've got some kind of new individuals who are just getting rich or have just got rich actually um, start spending more. And we're seeing though that luxury being spent in new markets such as like India and China. So I think it's something around like 40% of luxury shoppers are in China and then 30% in India. And it's just amazing to see how luxury has kind of evolved um, throughout the whole globe, really. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they've really, uh, the luxury brands as well have really sort of grasped, I think, these new markets. Um, I mean, obviously, they did face a bit of a problem in, in lockdown that they suddenly went from from being a sort of global and very physical business uh, to having all their shops shut and nobody traveling. And, and that was a nightmare. And then in subsequent, in previous reports sort of across that period, we've noted how they were very quick to adapt to e-commerce uh, and did quite well out of it but it's now that everything's back to as you say normal that they've uh, really started to surge but they, it has come back in a in a slightly different way and i think we have seen this huge reverse in europe i think post 2022 where there was a quite a downturn because of the economy uh, but it is this sort of asian consumers india and china as you say driving it but they're um they are new spenders and um i think it's how the the luxury brands and affordable luxury brands have really adapted to that and started to to um, to capitalise on that being where where their their new markets are has started to really pay off for them. Yeah, and I, and I think on that point as well is luxury was kind of set in their way in a bit in in a mm. in an aspect of they just stuck to like core product offerings. But now with that resurgence of the new markets, but also back to traveling is you've got their customers who aren't going to the office every day. They don't need a kind of luxury Dior or Chanel suit anymore in a different color. That's not enough to get them spending um, more and more. So what they've been doing really well is actually bringing out more clothing lines and giving the opportunity to their customers to also buy you know, nice kind of sportswear, cashmere jumpers, trainers, instead of just your, your classic tailoring. And I think that's really helped with them. And what they've done is they've brought it out in a, in a nice way so then they can get that younger audience to purchase from them as well. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, uh, I think you, yes, I think you've, you've really um, crystallised it there very well that they have adapted beautifully to, to, a changed market and done it quite quickly. I think that's something that the other sectors could should look at and and uh, 
you know, try and implement themselves because the, the world of retail just change all the time and it, it, it changes very rapidly. And I think the, a lot of the luxury uh, retailers have adapted very fast um, to changing sort of consumer shopping habits, which uh, neatly links to uh, the sort of next sort of set of um, slides that we can uh, have a look at from the report, which looks a bit more at um, how those shoppers shop. So, um, across those markets we've mentioned india china uh, are important uh, markets for the growth of um, luxury when you look at how consumers there are intending to sort of change their spending in the coming year uh, in india and china you can see that and uh, the uae um, egypt and uh, even in south africa uh, they're looking like to increase their spending um, which is encouraging so it, it does seem to be that not only has this come back uh, post sort of pandemic quite strongly that that in those markets that growth is set to continue um less sort of confident as to uh that sort of thing happening in the sort of european and north american markets where uh plans to sort of increase spending are, are sort of muted at best um though if you look at the the chart there uh, many of them are considering sort of maintaining the level of spend. But I think that sort of phenomenal growth we saw flipping from from sort of shrinkage to growth uh, in Europe is possibly coming to an end. I think maybe we've um, uh, used up that sort of slack that had been built into the market because of the economic issues in 2022. Um, I think we're now probably likely to see sort of more of a plateauing in spend on luxury in those markets. However, this growth in Asia, uh, India, and to some degree in the Middle East, uh, and parts of Africa is likely to push uh, growth of the sector up further in uh, in the year ahead. Um, so, how does that look in terms of generations? Um, I think again, younger shoppers are driving this. Um, they're the ones also who are planning to increase their spend, as you can see there, uh, Gen Zs and Millennials um, in particular. I think a lot of this is being again led in asia to some degree where younger shoppers are coming into their own there's a sort of burgeoning middle class who are often in that sort of particularly millennial bracket um i think there's possibly even sort of gen z's who are children of gen x and boomers who are uh, also coming to love the luxury um lifestyle and i think that's you know where a lot of this growth is going to come from but i think you also see that in the markets um of uh, Europe and North America in that, that uh, younger people are getting turned on to luxury brands. I think to some degree it's a reaction against um, sort of the ubiquity of fast fashion and high street sort of fashion in particular where they're increasingly some of them looking to spend more money on fewer but, but more unique items. Um, and there's still a huge cachet with a lot of these designer brands, particularly in some of the partnerships that those brands are doing which we shall come to a bit later on um in terms of where they shop uh as you can see there across the years uh it, it's resolutely a, an offline business really um luxury uh the vast majority of uh, of its sales to, uh, revenue comes from physical store interaction and that that's pretty similar not just across the sort of past five years but also across all the regions now experience as we said at the top of the webinar is everything in luxury it is very much about that sort of theater and and and, and that sort of feel, feeling of being involved and, and the physical side of it really does play a key role i think what this charts here don't really convey is, is the role that digital does play in getting them there so while the revenue might be coming from uh, more from offline than online and quite considerably and across the board country-wise uh, as well, um, actually digital is playing a role in getting those people to those stores. It's, you know, from, from sort of social media influence, um, and sort of, you know, pointing people to, towards the kind of goods they want to have, um, to, uh, to, to sort of, you know, research into those sort of goods, uh, it's then they're purchased physically um, as part of the, the sort of experience of doing it. Also, a lot of these things, a lot of luxury goods are purchased at travel hubs, particularly airports by international travellers. And so, again, 
it's very much skewed to, towards that physical retail. However, a lot of those purchases will have been made off the back of research and seeing this sort of stuff uh, digitally first. Equally, once it's been bought, it's then all over social media as people um, show off their purchases. Um, and so I think while, yes, it's very much an offline business, to some degree, digital plays a huge and significant role therein which i think is is backed up by the fact that that mobile is is pretty much the dominant force in that digital um expression of, of luxury buying that they, they one it's a, a younger market as we saw in the earlier slides but i think equally they're often better off they have top range smartphones and they use them and they use them for for internet access and um i think again as you see there from uh, the sort of bottom left in Asia, in particular, it's extremely mobile in terms of uh, where digital goods are purchased online. It's almost like three or well, three quarters of it is done on mobile, which again I think chimes with the demographic of age and new and young shoppers doing it, and it being a much more sort of mobile first world. But I think again, this is just based on sort of uh, purchases and revenue. I think again, it belies the role that mo mobile plays. In, in funneling people into actually buying uh, the luxury goods wherever they do it, uh, you know, sort of in, in travel hubs or at the, you know, on a shopping spree to their local town. Um, but yeah, so, so digital plays a vital role, like it does in across all retail. I think sort of it's it's easy to sort of see purchases, particularly in fashion and clothing, being made in stores, but but that doesn't necessarily tell you the whole story. What are your thoughts? Yeah, um, to totally agree with you, Paul. And I think it's kind of the rise of the influence as well. So you've got the influencers mm. making TikTok videos. They might not be influencers in terms of like celebrities that like you and I would know. It might be kind of famous TikTok or YouTubers who are going out, um, giving everyone that kind of shopping experience and documenting via video and streaming of their shopping experience going into, I don't know, let's say Tiffany's, for example, or Gucci. Mm. They go in there, showcase what a lovely experience they're having, um, get the products, wear them, again, show them off. But also there's a huge um, rise in social selling that we've seen that more mm. and more of our customers want to connect to social sites such as TikTok and Instagram. So then their customers can purchase directly and with those mm. videos, they're tagging in the products, they're getting paid to do it via, you know, the advertising. So, yeah, it's a, it's a massive kind of mobile shopping experience. Um, we've got kind of those Henry's, so the high earners, not yet rich, upping their spend. And they've got the accessibility to buy more products because those brands, are, as we mentioned, are diversifying. So, you go into Gucci, it's not just about the bags and the shoes anymore. They're also selling a, vari a variety of kind of fragrances from a price point of £50 up to £350. So it's giving those kind of not yet rich higher earners the ability to actually start low-ish in a way. And yeah. then, you know what, I want to spend more and more money on a certain product. And... I was shopping on Canada Goose a few months ago. It was getting cold, going skiing, needed a jacket. And the fact that I could also pay with Klarna as well. So mm. a lot of the goods are including payment options such as Klarna to get the kind of not yet rich people on board and, and changing those consumer di um, demographics. So it's just a crazy crazy world out there it's very mobile heavy especially in the millennials the the gen z's um they're yeah it, it's it's crazy what is happening it's, it's amazing for the luxury brands but the fact that they can also buy on you know buy now pay later or on flexible yeah. terms that creates more appetite to actually buy more of, from that brand but whilst they're still keeping it exclusive and it's still luxury items. And going back to what you said as well, Paul, in terms of sustainability, the millennials and Gen Zs are more conscious about where they're buying products from 
rather than mm. you kind of baby boomers and, and so on. So yes, yeah, it's, it's a crazy world that we're in. It's exciting, but um, yeah, and it's, I feel sorry for the luxury brands that are having to constantly adapt and change that kind of product mm. offering they're giving because they still want to attract the Gen X, the baby boomers and send them information in the way that they want to receive it. But then on the flip side, they need to do kind of TikTok and social selling and appease that new market that's coming in, which is the, the high earners not yet rich. Mm. I mean, it's a difficult balancing act for them as well, because obviously the more successful they become, the more widespread they are, the less exclusive they are, therefore the less their initial appeal might decline. Uh, yeah. So it's a very hard balancing act, I think, to sort of be able to offer Klarna, say, and attract that level of, of spender, uh, but also maintain this air that it's still quite significant. So I think, I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges that the luxury sector faces is how to, how to be affordable, but without being too affordable. Mm. And uh, and putting people off, and I think sort of how, how they how, how we see them manage that in the coming sort of year or so will be interesting to uh, to, to see. Um, but yeah, it is definitely a very mobile centric uh, sector, probably more so than most of the others that I've looked at. Um, of those that do buy digitally, obviously it's a very offline business compared to most but um within that sort of the, those that do shop digitally in luxury it's very mobile uh, and i think that'll only increase as it attracts more younger people uh the other thing of course that uh, attracts shoppers particularly in these younger demographics is the sustainability side of um luxury now uh the data that we've uh that we got from our own consumer research through consumer x about how uh global shoppers who have purchased sustainable luxury in the past year um who they are and, and what they look like is is quite interesting uh in that uh again they're higher earners but i think that's probably because it's it's luxury rather than than um you know any of the other retail sectors but it is something that they you know people can afford to buy sustainably they are tending to do so. Uh, I think those that have bought uh, sustainable luxury are, of course, the Gen Zs and Millennials. Significantly more of those are doing that than um, Gen X and uh, sort of baby boomers who are very much not interested in that at all. Um, but perhaps more interestingly is the sustainable shoppers for luxury are in China and India predominantly. Um, not so much when you look at uh, the US, the UK, Canada, those sort of developed markets, uh, very much not so interested in sustainability. And um, it's been quite hard to, to unlock why that might be the case. But um, I think what it might come down to potentially is that in those markets, particularly in India, they're one they're quite new that these shoppers there are quite new to buying these things so they're coming at it without this sort of legacy of fast fashion and disposability it's something that they they actually are new to and cherish uh also they've possibly witnessed more firsthand the actual environmental impact of unsustainable uh particularly sort of uh, fashion apparel manufacturer because a lot of it does take place uh, in India and around Asia. So potentially it, it's a sort of uh, awakening there into to wanting to do things differently. One, because they can, because they're new. Two, because they know how bad this can be. This carries over into sort of the other side of the sustainability play in luxury, which is the sort of growing purchasing of secondhand. Now, luxury is interesting in terms of secondhand purchasing because obviously the goods, particularly sort of uh, big brand fashion items, have uh, you know an inherent value around their brand, brand as we as we discussed, and can be quite expensive first time round. So there's a healthy second hand market, particularly among younger shoppers who want a piece of that sort of glamorous luxury action. Uh, they want the uniqueness of it as well, and often the vintage side of it. But um, you know, to make it affordable, they have to buy pre loved. Uh, and as you know, we all know, there's been a sort of surge in in um, 
pre-love sort of uh, fashion sites, Depop, people like that, Vinted, uh, who are selling you know, secondhand luxury goods. But it's very popular. It's very popular globally. Uh, and it follows almost exactly the same pattern as the interest in sustainability. Uh, higher earners are wanting to buy secondhand luxury. It's the younger end of the market who want to buy it. And, you know, again, China and India dominate less interest in it in uh, or very little interest in it really in, in the UK uh, and, and those sorts of markets. So we've seen quite a lot of um, this move towards sustainability in secondhand is, is, is a growth area for the luxury market. Uh, but again, it's very much being driven by this this younger, newer breed of luxury shoppers, particularly in these other markets. What uh, what are your thoughts on on the sustainability side of things, Emily? Yeah, um, we we've seen a massive increase in spend where brands have reinvented themselves to be more ethical and sustainability caring for example you wrote a good article in about caring and their impact to sustainability and becoming more ethical uh we know i think it's about 46 percent of shoppers are looking to purchase luxury clothing um but they are to do with that and they will spend the luxury the 48 percent of the shoppers looks looking to purchase the luxury clothing are looking for sustainability Mm. reasons to why so if a product doesn't highlight the sustainability of the offering or ethical information then they might not necessarily buy you mentioned depop and vintage we're also seeing how lots of other department stores like selfridges for example they've got a pre-loved section on there so you can yeah. resell yeah. your products to the likes of selfridges and then it gives a buyers an option well the customers an option to actually purchase at a discounted price but still have you know that Louis Vuitton bag or those Prada shoes whatever it may be so yeah I, I think that's a huge thing and, and we see a lot of kind of brands and retailers focusing more on that now um, and it goes to again like the rental Selfridges for example mm. they have an element where you can rent designer dresses bags jewelry whatever it may be, because you might not, you might be going to a wedding, you might not necessarily want to buy a dress that you're only going to wear once because, hey, social media is on the rise. Everyone will judge me if I wear that dress more than once. So it's, um, so it's then just buying and renting the dress and it sells, um, it says on there, like, you know, rent for £26 a day, retail price £400. So when you rent that dress, it kind of gives you that good feeling that, you're being sustainable, but also you're dressing nicely as well. You know that your dress is designer, so you have a certain swag about yourself, I imagine, anyway. So, um, yeah, I, I think second hand is great and it is coming up. It's, it, yeah, I, I think a lot more brands are being more conscious of it as well, especially with the various different legislations that are coming into play, such like the digital product passports in the next few years. Yeah, I mean, it's also it's a win-win, isn't it? Because the consumer gets to wear designer clothes at an affordable price, and they get to feel that they're doing something sort of uh, for the greater good. Uh, it, it's an interesting play. I think yes, as, as you bring up sort of um, rentals and their subs you can their subscription services where you can subscribe to to have designer handbags, you know, a certain number of them every month and that kind of thing. I think this is is an interesting take on. Um, on, on selling luxury uh you mentioned selfridges do it a number of a number of companies do do it but a lot of the players who are offering these services are new and they're new to the market and and so i guess they're buying stuff from luxury brands and then renting them out so what impact this has on luxury brands bottom line and their overall value of of that side of the luxury market i think remains to be seen but i think it's definitely um something we're going to see a lot more of particularly as if the sort of consumer interest in in being you know buying luxury continues at the pace that we've seen so far um which brings us neatly to where next for a lot of these luxury brands uh and some of the things we identified in the um in the report i mean there, there are many sort of uh 
sort of trends emerging within retail generally and luxury in, in particular. But the ones that stood out for me that I've pulled out for, for the webinar are that um, there's a huge amount of diversification happening within the luxury market. A lot of it, though, through acquisition. So somewhat counterintuitively, these massive groups like um, LVMH and Kering and Richemont are expanding by buying up all these niche players so that they end up with a beautiful portfolio of across all segments of the luxury industry um often in, in many ways saving some legacy brands that would otherwise i think probably go to the wall um but they're, they're diversifying their portfolio uh but the the counter side of that is that in the luxury industry it's very hard now to find uh unique luxury brands who aren't owned particularly by one of those three companies um not impossible but uh, that's largely what uh, is happening currently and, and of course lvmh and kering and richmond are, are, are phenomenally large and phenomenally successful and i think um it, it's interesting to see how that model has developed and developed sort of reasonably rapidly and i think it's also um has helped the luxury industry grow because it's had these sort of big big players behind uh, the smaller brands and keeping them afloat so uh, it makes the whole thing work some of the other diversifications that we've seen as well are, are some really interesting sort of um seemingly off the wall sort of tie-ups like bulgari are opening or have uh, well i mean they opened their first hotel many years ago but they're, they're increasingly and slowly opening hotels in uh, key resorts around the world i think they're doing miami and uh, la this year and uh, i think somewhere uh, like the maldives next year but they're 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 opening these luxury sort of super luxury hotels that are dripping in their own products and their own style but they're they're turning a profit and when bulgari first opened its first hotel it was largely sort of uh, poo-pooed by uh industry watchers who thought it was just a, a, a ludicrous diversification away from what its core business was and this would never work it would just cost a lot of money it was a, it was a vanity project so that not to be the case at all it's actually done very really well for the, the group and it makes a, a sort of you know reasonable contribution to its bottom line similarly dolce and gabbana uh run a real estate business in uh, in uh, manhattan uh, which I think it also has plans to expand in other key areas uh, around the US. So again, adding the the brand name to something totally different. Uh, I guess sort of you know luxury apartments are luxury, but it's it's not usually in the remit of the luxury industry. So again, it's been some interesting diversifications there. Um, the other thing, of course, that luxury brands have done over the past sort of five years with great success, and which I did talk about earlier on, is this partnerships and tie ups where they've often taken a more established brand that to reach those new uh, shoppers, particularly the younger ones, they've had to do tie-ups with other uh, players. So there's been, there was a lot sort of about three or four years ago with, 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 with rappers. Uh, more recently, it's been in many ways more mainstream than that. So uh, uh, Balmain, tied up with barbie did a whole capsule wardrobe uh, around the barbie movie that obviously was totally pink uh, i mean a, a lot of brands in and out of luxury tied up with the barbie movie it was quite a sort of astounding uh, marketing opportunity for many brands but balmain one of the luxury ones who really uh, went for it and did very well out of it um you know it got them real attention it got them real attention with a much younger and much newer audience uh, so I think that's something that we'll see maybe capitalised on. Uh, Jimmy Choo tied up with Jean-Paul Gaultier. Again, both key luxury brands, but working together, uh, trying to sort of maximise, I think, their sort of niche reach that they each have to create something new. Uh, a particular favourite of mine, Tiffany and uh, Nike teamed up um, and made literally made bejeweled trainers. It uh, was quite extraordinary. But again, it, it, it Nike big brand who wants to have that high-end feel in as part of its range tiffany why would tiffany ever come near people who wear trainers but but they do uh, and i think that's a really interesting shift in in where someone like tiffany is coming from to try and sort of shift a really established uh, 
really kind of uh, dare I say stayed brand into something that's that's much more modern, much more street. Uh, uh, so that that was a very interesting type. And of course, um, for those of you that watch Netflix, there's the Dior series is um, coming to Netflix, which is about the history of Dior which again is a really unusual tie-up but uh an interesting new way of using i guess media to publicize yourself in, in, in a sort of biopic fashion so uh, again i'm very intrigued to see it because i think it's a it is a very interesting story the story of deal um but i think also it it's it's going to put deal in front of a whole load of people who maybe might not have considered it uh, we mentioned subscriptions and rentals. Uh, that's something that's uh, that's growing, I think. Uh, we mentioned some of the companies. There's some others, Rent and Runway, Vivrel, Vince Unfold. Um, there's a huge number of subscription and rental companies in luxury on the cusp of between fashion and luxury. Um, you're seeing a lot of the ones that do rentals of, of, of a much broader fashion thing having a luxury end because it, it's sort of part of a broad spectrum of what they can offer and i think we're going to see more luxury items offered in that way because it, it just makes it more affordable uh and then of course one of the uh the last sort of two interesting things uh our authentication is becoming increasingly important um as luxury becomes more popular and more luxury goods are sold obviously knowing that they're for real uh is is vital and there are a whole load of startups doing it i've mentioned just four there that do a variety of things there's ones with special tags that get sewn into the clothes that are trackable uh there's a photo database app that uses ai and image recognition to um, authenticate things particularly useful in the second hand market uh red points does the same but with for fakes uh, and of course uh the use of blockchain to um to track the the veracity of uh of, of luxury items uh, and the final thing really is the growing use of ethical materials and ethical sourcing it comes back to the sustainability element but we're seeing a lot more effort now being made not only in selling the idea that luxury is is inherently sustainable because you buy less of it uh, but also that it's going to be made in, in a more ethical way and to some degrees the luxury industry has enough um margin in what it sells to, to be able to afford to make things more uh, ethical and to source things more more sort of practically uh, there's also a growing use of uh, of like modern materials particularly in jewelry where we are starting to see uh man-made diamonds uh, actually becoming something that is desirable uh and is being sold as something that's desirable because obviously diamond mining is quite a environmentally intense uh undertaking so that's some of the uh, the sort of key upcoming things I think that we we identified. I don't know what are some of your thoughts on that, Emily. What have you been seeing in the market? I mean, where where do I start? Um, yeah, I think it's super exciting that entertainment is becoming more and more, and the luxury markets are focusing and spending a lot of investment on entertainment. You got Kering who have just purchased a Hollywood agency. So I'm excited to see what they're going to do there. Netflix, as you rightly mentioned, we've got the dual series that's coming out that I'm super excited about. And it'd be interesting to see how that shift from traditional luxury through to kind of modern day luxury, including sustainability, will be portrayed on there. And depends how well mm. um, Dior does then I can just imagine other luxury retailers doing the exact same thing. Next, it'll be Tiffany's and it'll be Chanel. It's, yeah. it's a great story and, and, you, and it helps those Gen Z and millennials buy into the brand and actually understand that it is a luxury brand that they're investing in. It's not just a one piece that you're going to throw away into landfill or it's going to not be in fashion. It's That's the nice thing about luxury is – you buy your pieces and you know that they're going to last, but they're not going to go out of fashion, which is nice. Mm -hmm. The The subscription market just blows my mind. Um, it's amazing how you can just rent Cartier pieces, uh, Bottega Veneda handbags for what, $45 a month. It's, I, I love, I love the approach that luxury are taking with that. Don't know 
if it's going to dilute, as you mentioned before, Paul, basically how how are they going to keep it exclusive if you can do those those um, aspects of that rental service or, you know, pre-loved service? I'd love to be able to stay in um, a nice hotel. Um, Balmain Hotel would be great, wouldn't it? But um, hey, we'll, we'll get there one day. But I think, again, that's giving their customers that exclusivity back in a way. So they've been loyal customers to the brand for so long. Why not stay in our hotel? It's kitted out with all of our, our um, products and, all, and our brand. But also you get to purchase the products as well. So I think with the luxury brands not only selling just footwear, ready to wear clothing, they're also going down the homeware route as well. So Hermes, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. you buy you know, a lot of china plates, matching cutlery sets and everything like that. So I think that's how they're going to, I think that's how the exclusivity is going to keep apparent is by being able to diversify into homeware and not just you know your jewelry your handbags your clothes so yeah, yeah. I, I think it's no, interesting. yeah no i think you're right i think one of the things i didn't mention actually is is uh it's the homewares but there's also a lot of um a lot of the luxury brands are also diversifying into um cosmetics and beauty and wellness products as well uh by either partnering with people or uh, acquiring people or or sticking their name on uh, existing brands products so um yeah that again i think is another interesting area where where the luxury industry is, is has got a lot of potential growth i think in terms of just diversifying a bit what they actually sell around a brand so while it's always been very brand led those brands are starting to become a little more elastic i think as to what they actually represent so uh, it's like tiffany and, and nike for example i mean it's it's no longer just about jewelry it's about jeweled footwear which is you know you can't really i don't think you can get really much different between a pair of trainers and, and tiffany jewelry they're you know they're opposite ends of the sort of uh, of the scale but bringing them together perhaps creates something quite uh, new and powerful so uh yeah i think it's some some interesting developments to look forward to in the uh, in the year ahead um that was really all i had to share on this the report is out uh right now um a link uh, to download it will magically appear on your screen um there uh and um do give it a read there's a lot more in the report than we've touched on here obviously many of the things we've talked about are in there and much more um so please do uh, have a read of it but uh, for now emily thank you very much for joining us thank you for sharing your wisdom and insights it's been really uh, interesting it's been a great discussion thank you everybody for watching and uh, we'll see you again soon thanks paul